What's up everybody, PG Braun here, president of Blackstone Labs. I'm here with man, Coach Don. Yes. What is, tell everybody all your uh, accolades. You're, you're, he's way more than just a therapist, that's for sure. Um, so basically, I got my first personal training job in 1992. So I've been a trainer for 27 years now. Um, I would say sometime in probably the last 10 to 15 years, I've kind of transitioned over into, I consider myself to be more of a strength coach. Um, I'm also a uh, licensed manual therapist. Um, I started in 93 um, with massage. I went to massage school in 93 and back then, everybody was gearing up for the 96 Olympics. So instead of doing the like a traditional spa route, I went right into sports massage and rehab and sports medicine. So um, particularly the last probably 10, 12 years, I've worked with a lot of professional athletes, NFL, uh, MMA, worked with several of the UFC guys. Um, and so at that level, when you're working with that level of athlete, everything is systems. So, you know, there's a big difference in any profession between the top 15% in your profession in terms of skills um, versus the top 10, the, the, the top five. So when you get to that level, everything is systems. So a couple of the systems that I work within the functional movement screen and the selective functional movement assessment. Um, and so I am actually not a physical therapist. Um, I am a corrective exercise specialist. However, at that level, um, like the SFMA and the FMS are basically designed by the top physical therapist and rehab therapist in the world. Um, so yeah, um, basically um, I am a strength coach and a rolfer. Yeah. And I was gonna say that he's a badass, so that's a way better description than that. And I apologize if a badass didn't do all that justice, but he is a badass. And the reason I say that is we went up to see a gentleman by the name of Eric Cressy who works with a lot of uh, Major League Baseball players, tennis players, people that are involved with a lot of shoulder movement. And my shoulders don't really move at all anymore, so we decided to try to go outside the box because I've done everything from stem cells to dry needling to every kind of massage, any kind of exercise you can think of. Please don't send me an advice. I've already tried it. My MRI is pretty crazy. We believe that there's a lot of neurological stuff going on as well, so we had him look at it, and he put together a plan that was pretty damn comprehensive and there's probably no way I would be able to do it on my own. So Don ste stepped up and he's the guy that's been taking me through this and it's basically, I'm calling it Operation Bring My Shoulders Back and it's been humbling to say the least because a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna do here, you guys are probably gonna be like, oh, I could do that in my sleep. Uh, but I am so far gone, I suppose, in, in the other direction that bringing myself back, I'm, I'm basically teaching certain muscles to, to, to even work. Again, so also want to say, just for the sake of this video, that my AC broke a couple days ago and they didn't fix it yet and it's really hot in here already. Uh, and that's gonna make this worse. But this is what I've been doing, guys, before I go to the gym a few days a week. And I'm actually gonna go to the gym after this and I have noticed that I am getting a lot more blood into my shoulders after. I will have to take my shirt off for part of this and you guys will still think my shoulders suck, but we are seeing things happening and I'm excited about that. So it starts out with a lot of foam rolling, which I'm gonna do now. And Don will just explain why I'm doing everything that I'm doing. Absolutely. So um, one of the things that's interesting about foam rolling is, um, foam rolling, you see a lot of people these days do foam rolling and generally what people do, well, they'll jump on the foam roller for a minute or two and they'll kind of do a hokey pokey and they'll you know bounce around and then they'll go about their business. Um, it actually takes um, a certain amount of time, um, like PJ and I talk about time under tension, it takes a certain amount of time actually on a tissue to produce any appreciable change. So um, PJ, have you ever done any foam rolling before? Um, yeah, so many years ago when I first decided I wanted to become a personal trainer, I researched a bunch of the different courses that were out there and I was in school at the time at UConn studying exercise physiology and I came across the NASM yep. certification and there was quite a lot with foam rolling in there. So when I got my certification, I got really into foam rolling and the earlier part of my bodybuilding career, I was powerlifting a lot. And I actually used to foam roll as a, a big part of my routine and then as I got older, I got 
lazier is the, is the only way I put it. And I hadn't foam rolled in many, many years before we got into doing this again. Um, for me as a therapist, I thought uh, it was really interesting. I think Jay Cutler was one of the first guys, uh, bodybuilders to really publicize um, doing a lot of uh, deep tissue work, a lot of myofascial release and doing a lot of foam rolling. So um, the foam rolling that we're doing with PJ is, is probably a lot more targeted and a lot more specific um, than uh, most people do. So one of the things that was interesting for me when I first became a massage therapist and I was studying sports medicine and part of my sports medicine program is I had to work literally hundreds of different sporting events in the Tampa Bay area, uh, running, cycling, uh, professional volleyball. Um, and so part of the sports medicine process is learning how to work with athletes in different phases of competition. So we have what we call pre, inter, and post. So pre-event could be anything from six months out up to 30 minutes before an event. Um, inter is obviously like if you're an athlete that you have heat is, you know, what work can we do in between your heats to help you uh, stay peak to perform? And then obviously we have post. So one of the things that we're working with PJ right now, um, you know, and obviously PJ has incredible experience as a competitor and he really knows his body. So we're really just kind of experimenting with different routines to see like what is going to support him best in his workouts. Case in point, what did you say the other day, PJ? Like at one point it was like when you put it all together, it was like three hours straight. Yeah. He was like, well, I don't know if I can do three hours straight. So we just, you know, um, break up the different components, different elements and see how they come together um, and what's gonna produce the best result for him. Yeah, so what I've been trying to do is the days that we do these, go to the gym and do whatever my scheduled body part is plus the exercises that I have to do, specific shoulder exercises like landmine presses, things like that, free motion machine. Um, and when I was doing it in the beginning, if I did cardio, it also was wound up being like over three straight hours of work and I was just a zombie. At the end, I realized that A, I'm probably gonna have to change my lifestyle and get away from the fasting <laughs> if I'm gonna keep doing that. Or I'm gonna have to break this up because I'm just not, as young as I once was, where I could just train for hours and hours and hours. Um, but now we've got it. It seems like we've figured out the recipe for success. Those past couple times, this last one being the best, where I do this first, and then I go to the gym, and then I do the cardio later on. But the key for me has been getting right to the gym right after I do this, that's when I feel the most ready for action. And I have actually, the past two times, I've gotten cramps and, and definitely some spasms going on, like in some of these muscles, like my posterior delts that haven't fired in many, many years. So I, I feel very confident in this plan that we have right now. So this is actually an interesting story, the way that this came about because for a little over a year now, I've been PJ's therapist. So I do the manual therapy work. Um, I haven't been his trainer. Um, and so over the years, I've worked on a lot of um, elite interdisciplinary teams where you have different chiros and PTs and physical therapists all working together on a team or an athlete. And I can tell you from experience that um, when you bring all of those different elements together, it doesn't always go well, that expression, uh, too many uh, cooks in the kitchen. Um, and so, you know, for the last year, I've primarily been PJ's manual therapist, not necessarily his trainer. So one of my expertise is in corrective exercise. So PJ and I were having a conversation and basically I was doing some manual therapy on him. I was doing some soft tissue work and then he was trying to hit certain poses like his rear lat spread, his rear double bicep. Um, and so just in noticing the way that he was, you know, hitting his poses, I did a few, like basically a movement assessments. And one of the things that we determined from a biomechanical standpoint is, is that 
PJ was really lacking extension in his spine, which is, you know, very common if you think of bodybuilders, you know, this is really a simplified version, but you're doing this and you're doing this and so you really get medially rotated in your shoulders and in your chest and your thoracic spine becomes very stiff. So for him to engage his posterior shoulder, he has to be able to get into extension in his spine. So that's one of the things that we've been working on is really trying to improve uh, mobility in his thoracic spine. Um, PJ has a lot of pathology in his shoulders, a lot of joint damage, um, which is, you know, just a collection of years of hard training. So when you consider the shoulder joint, it's actually pretty complex. It's a relationship between the thoracic spine, the shoulder, the rib cage, all of those elements come together. So if you're not addressing all of them, then um, you're probably not going to have the best results. You've got like, like when I work with athletes and I teach them very specialized warm-ups, it's like you've got foam rolling, you've got, you know, dynamic warm-ups, mm -hmm. you've got recruitment. You don't want to be doing that for 45 minutes because yeah. then by the time you get to your workout, you're already burned out. Yeah. So you really try and abbreviate that. And you know, I always tell my clients, if you spend seven, eight minutes foam rolling before you work out, and then at the end of the day, if you're getting ready to go to bed, if you've got some extra time and you want to spend 10, 15 minutes, then you can put it in at the end of your day. So this is a kind of an interesting component. You know, one of the benefits of, you know, being in the industry for a very long time, you know, I've developed relationships with some of the top people in the industry. Um, and so example in this case is, you know, I'm a manual therapist, but I'm not a clinician. So that being said, I have some really good doctors in the area that I like to work with. Um, so in this case, in PJ's case, uh, he mentioned Eric Cressy. You know, Eric Cressy is one of the top strength coaches in the country and what he's known for is specializing in major league uh, baseball pitchers so if you consider those guys guys that are throwing 90 100 mile an hour fastballs if you've ever looked at the slow motion of one of the pitchers the range of motion on the pitch is pretty extreme the torque the velocity in the shoulder is pretty extreme so needless to say a guy that throws 100 mile an hour fastballs for a living his shoulder is going to be a little bit different um, in PJ's case, there's probably not a lot of people that have that kind of shoulder. Um, and so for me, one of the things that I wanted to do was really just get some very specific direction and rule a lot of things out. Um, and I'm certainly good with shoulders, but in Eric's case, you know, that's what he does all day long. So we went up and we did an appointment with Eric and, and actually we, we got a lot of really good news. Yes, PJ has some, you know, long-standing injuries. He's got some joint damage. Like I like to tell a lot of my athletes is, no, you know, over time, if you've had a lot of joint damage, the, the articular surfaces of the joints get worn down. So is PJ gonna have a 20-year-old shoulder again? Probably not. But the good news that we got was, is that Eric felt that there wasn't really anything to prevent, you know, really getting some you know, pretty decent improvement in PJ shoulder mechanics. So that was, I think, a really welcome surprise for us. So one of the things that's interesting with, you know, professional bodybuilders is that, you know, they do a lot of single joint isolation exercises and they're really building up their prime movers, uh, pecs and lats and quads, hamstrings and glutes. Um, and so what happens is, is those prime movers really start to overpower the stabilizers. An example in PJ's case, we talked about him being really medially rotated. 
So there's not a lot of space in the anterior shoulder to start with. So then when you immediately rotate the shoulder, now there's even less space, okay? And so what is happening is, is that the head of his humerus is basically smashing up into the underside of his AC joint. So a lot of the stuff that we're working on is getting him into that overhead position. But in this case, instead of his arm running into the top of his shoulder, we're trying to get some more mobility in his shoulder blade. So PJ, I'm gonna change this a little bit. Okay. So when you start in this down position mm -hmm. and just start neutral, okay. and even if it's a lot of, I just want you to think about externally rotating when you come up, okay. and then when you get to the top, I want you to actually push into the roller and pull it back down. Okay. One of the things that was interesting that PJ and I have talked about is, is that the nervous system is incredibly adaptive and specialized. So some of the workouts that PJ does as a bodybuilder, you bring in the average person and just from a nervous system standpoint, they're gonna be absolutely fried. They don't have the same, I guess, uh, mind-muscle connection. Now in this case, we're asking PJ to do a lot of exercises that he's never done before. So his nervous system doesn't really have a reference point. So for PJ, a 500 pound bench press is probably a lot easier and a lot less taxing than some of these very small, intricate movements. Okay, I'm going to over here. I want you to actually, it's almost like a traction. So I want you to just start here. It's, Put your hands on your chest like this and do, so this is the movement. Okay. So just start there. Good. And maybe instead of a little less of attraction, but when you drop into that squat, I want you to actually reach your hands forward, like really actively reach, 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 reach further, 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 good, like that. Very nice. It's funny, yesterday, Stephen Wayne, we did back, and he was cramping a lot and he was trying to stretch and I actually showed him this exercise, th this stretch. And he was like, holy crap, I feel the stretch like all the way down into my hip. And I was like, yeah, it's a good one. I've been <laughs> doing this one the past couple of weeks. One hand, okay. So it's that same stretch, but a couple of things. When you drop back, you're gonna externally rotate. And here's the other thing is, the tendency here, because we're tractioning, we're pulling the shoulder, is for the shoulder to come forward anterior. So he wants you to hold that pack. Okay. So the head of the humerus is set, externally rotate, because you don't want any pinch in the front. You should feel it in your lap, and then you can kind of fish around and play with the angle. And actually, in this case, PJ, turn it into like a lat stretch. Okay. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, it's not pinching either, so. Okay, good. PJ wouldn't like this very much, but when I work with a lot of my athletes, one of the things that we say is basically you have to earn the right to do everything, okay? So if you want to overhead press, there's a series of criteria, and if you don't meet that criteria, then you haven't earned the right to do that movement. And what does that mean? If you try to do things that you haven't earned the right to do, then chances are you're probably gonna get injured, okay? So most, I don't like to say most, but I'm just gonna give you a, a common presentation of an athlete that is doing overhead pressing, okay? so. I do an assessment, it's basically what we call a lat length test. So 
if you stand on the wall and you flatten your lower back against the wall and you flex your abs, okay, and you lock out your elbow, you should be able to take your thumb and put it on the wall behind your head. So for me, this is about as far as I can go. So what happens generally is if you tell your brain to do something, your brain is going to find a way to do it. So the common compensations that we see is the elbow breaks and the rib cage extends. The problem with that is because you're lacking the movement and sometimes it's mobility, sometimes it's stability, but if you don't have that movement and you're going overhead, all you're doing is just grinding up your shoulders. So come on in PJ. So tuck your hips so your lower back is flat against the wall. Lock both your elbows out like this. Stick your thumbs out. No rib flare. Go straight overhead. Keep you in right there. So is that it for you right there? Now I'm going to try a little experiment. I'm just going to hold this. So here's something that's interesting, okay? Is I'm asking PJ to basically take his arm overhead and I'm taking away his compensations. I'm not letting him arch his back and I'm not letting him break his elbow. So he gets to about there, right? So that must mean he has a tight shoulder. But what's interesting is, is that when I come in and I go passively, now I'm still, I'm not letting him break the elbow. And, and if he's holding his abs, tell me when you, if you feel pain. So in this case, there's a big difference between what we call active and passive ranges of motion. So see if you follow me here, is if PJ tries to take his arm overhead and that's it, the first common assumption is, is oh, I'm tight, my shoulder's tight. But hang on a second, what does that exactly mean? People feel tension in their body and they associate tension to tightness, tightness to shortness. Shortness needs to be stretched, right? But in this case, okay, if PJ's shoulder was actually tight, it wouldn't matter if he was doing it, okay, or if I was doing it for him. If the tissue was tight, if the joint was stuck, it wouldn't matter whether he was doing it or I was doing it for him, it wouldn't go. But in this case, you go ahead and do the movement, okay? Now it's interesting now that I've kind of guided you through the movement a couple of times, it's actually improved. So what that's telling me is when there's a big difference between active and passive movements, PJ shoulder is actually not tight. That's actually what we call a stability or motor control dysfunction. And I'm gonna step over here, so go ahead and do the movement. Right about there, okay. Yeah. And let's just start with, um, bring this forward a little bit is just passive external rotation. So just take your arm back and relax. Again. Good. And relax. Now where are you feeling that right now, PJ? Inside the back in, in here. So this is actually kind of cool and we've been working on this quite a bit is if you do that again and relax. Okay. And do it again. As right now, you can kind of see that when he externally rotates his arm, if you're watching, you can kind of see it chattering, it's jumping. And so I'm reaching behind and I'm putting my hand right on his rotator. Uh, Terry's minor infraspinatus. And go. We can actually feel the rotator firing. So it was really cool. So last night, uh, Deanna came to massage me and I told her that what I wanted her to prioritize. And so when she was back there, she, she goes, holy shit. Yeah. I go, what? And she goes, I can actually, for the first time, feel the fibers in here. Yeah. She's like, usually you can't find them. Yeah. So I was like, fuck, you just got me really excited. Excuse my language. So here's what I want you to do now is I want you to, now we're going to make this like a resistance workout. Mm -hmm. So I want you to push through my resistance. Okay. Go. And relax. Now, one of the things that um, Eric Cressy did tell PJ, one of the things that he noted was is strong as PJ is, as much muscle mass as PJ has, his rotator cuff was actually really weak. So 
push and relax and one more time and relax okay very good just keep that open so I'll let you start So then you do one more on each side on your own. Actually, I want it to. So. Is that both sides? I'm gonna have you do one more set, slide all the way over to that side of the table. Okay. So just in this case, particularly with your history of the anterior dislocations, mm -hmm. When you do this, remember we want to keep that okay. a little forward of the shoulder. Because this is so taxing to the nervous system, the rep schemes and the volumes are a lot less. Um, let's get you to go face down, PJ. So, actually, go ahead and put your face in the table. So we're going to start here, and all I want you to do is external rotation. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, internal rotation. Okay, I got a little nervous in the presence of the camera. So we always want to loosen up the T-spine before we try to do shoulder stuff because otherwise your shoulder's trying to operate through a stiff, stiff spine. Push your hand, so just open your palm, push it into my leg. Push and relax and push and relax. Good job. And push and relax and push and relax and push and hold, 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 hold and relax. Good. Stand up. There you go, open hand. Am I going over with it? Yep. It's actually straighten that leg out. Push to the ceiling. Back. 
So one of the interesting things is when we talk about functional movement, functional movement has almost become a ubiquitous term in the industry like core training. Um, you know, what is the core? So uh, one of the interesting uh, developments is what we call the neurodevelopmental perspective. And, and here's what that means is they kind of reverse engineered human movement, right? So they started looking at baby and said, well, how does baby develop movement? You know, baby, you know, lays on his back and then he picks up his head and then he rolls over, and then he sits up, then he crawls and ultimately he walks. So they started to reverse engineer and take people through that process. And what's crazy is the number of very like high level elite athletes that can't do simple things like roll over. Does that make sense? To so kind of reverse engineering the movement. So what I want you to do is you're basically going to hip hinge like this. Mm -hmm. Put your hands together and I want you to just open your T-spine like that. Okay. pressure in the anterior shoulder, okay? No. Um, PJ has a history of anterior uh, dislocation of his shoulder, so come up again. So what we want to actually do is we want to rotate the thoracic spine. So I'm going to be careful if I come in here and just start cranking on his arm, I can really hurt his shoulder. Big difference with when you help me versus when I have to do it myself. Absolutely. Would you fire me if I dislocated your shoulder? <laughs> Maybe. Let's, let's not find out. <laughs> Am I going the other side? Yeah. Uh, do one more on that side. Okay, and I will hold that arm. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Good. Good job. Remember the reach, roll, and lift? Yeah. Okay. Now, let me just say this is I don't actually care if you get your hand off the table. Yeah. If you're trying to lift it off the table, you're, you're using the right muscles. Okay. So a lot of these exercises, you know, to the untrained person, if you're just looking at it, it's like, yeah, that's really super simple. Um, but in, in PJ's case is that, you know, your body is a master compensator. So if you ask your body to do something, it's going to find a way to do it. And oftentimes it's compensation. So a lot of these exercises are purposely putting him in a position that he can't compensate. Like if you watch this last rep, normally what happens is, is instead of him lifting his arm, instead of firing that posterior uh, rotator, he just extends into his back. So one of the exercises on there that's uh, like a TRX row. So before how we were going, like the wall slides and we're going all the way up, you just have your elbows on the TRX and you're just kind of staying in that mid range and just getting that scapula to translate. Um, so one of the things with PJ, particularly because he's got such dominant lat, is the lats are really depressing the scapula down, okay? 
So one of the things that happens is when that scapula is heavily depressed and he takes his arm forward, okay, the head of the humerus is jamming into the underside of his, uh, what we call a, cr a chromioclavicular joint. So one of the things that we're really working on is, is trying to get this movement of the scapula where we have this upward rotation and elevation. So take your arm up overhead, is getting his scapula to do that. So now when his scapula translates like this, now the head of his humerus isn't banging into. So come, come back for a second. So let me do a little bit of anatomy as you've got the head of your humerus and then you've got your clavicle or collarbone and then you've got your scapula or shoulder blade. So the scapula and the shoulder blade come together, the two bones come together and there is some, some cartilage in there and that forms a joint. So you've got a lot of different types of joints like your hip is a ball and socket. In this case, this is what we call a gliding joint. And so the bones come together and there's some cartilage in there and that's just designed to flex and expand. So collarbone, shoulder blade, that's your AC joint. And underneath that is the head of your humerus. And in between this very narrow space is all the tendons and nerves that exit down into your arm. So normally what happens in a healthy shoulder is when the shoulder translates up, okay, there's room, okay? So in this case, if you're medially rotating, meaning your shoulders roll forward, now we're reducing that space. And if you don't have stability in the shoulder, when you start to raise your shoulder up, instead of there being space, that head of that shoulder drifts up and starts smacking into the underside of the AC joint and impinging all the nerves. So that's part of what we're working is working on getting that rotator to stabilize the head of the humerus. So then when he's pressing, that shoulder is not smashing up and that's where most of the damage is done. Forward head posture is certain uh, muscles that stabilize the neck, they become very weak and then other muscles become very short and tight. So you're in this forward head position. So part of what we're working on is to get some stability back into the neck and actually create this movement versus yep. driving back through. The first time I did this, it seemed so simple, just pulling your chin in, and my neck was so stiff and tight. Afterwards, I, 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 my neck was like exhausted afterwards. Just, like, I couldn't believe it. Part of what, at least in my opinion, I think any good coach, we use the, the Arnold Schwarzenegger story, um, my understanding was is that when Arnold first came to America, his calves were like his worst body part. And so Arnold being Arnold, he cut all of the legs out of all of his pants because he didn't want to hide his weaknesses. Um, and of course, all his buddies really, you know, roused him and gave him a hard time. And ultimately that wound up being one of his best body parts. So in my case, particularly from a biomechanics standpoint, part of my job through assessment is to identify um, weaknesses. So in PJ's case, you know, he has some incredible strengths, but what we're really targeting in, in strategically, structurally, uh, neurologically is finding his weaknesses and, and just really hammering those. Um, why don't I do a little bit of soft tissue? So what was different last time? So last time I kind of cranked on your rear delts and rotated a little bit. You felt like that made a big difference? Yeah, or I mean, was it just everything that we did? I, it could have been everything all together or maybe just like each one getting better with everything. So what we'll do next time is... Um, is now, I was a little bit weaker in the gym yeah. and I didn't do as much volume, but I felt very productive with what I did. See, that was my concern with yeah. that, especially if you feel good and go crazy and lift really heavy. But what we'll do different next week is, is I'll do some deep work before we do all of our exercises, okay. you know. And I think, and again, look at this, is like you're getting two to three massages a week. No, I'm sorry, two. And you're doing the foam rolling, right? So I think because you're getting all this body work, maybe you need a little less foam rolling. But again, I think it's just part of your warm up process. Mm -hmm. If you can do five to seven minutes of, you know, really condensed and focused trigger point work and foam rolling before, it doesn't have to be a lot amount of time, but I think it'll really help. Mm -hmm. Each time that I've gone from here right into the gym and I've done some posterior and medial delt exercises as, as well as some free motion stuff, I've been feeling 
a lot more blood in the in the area overall. Yeah. I'm mean, obviously got a ways to go, but I, I'm definitely noticing it. Dude, I feel like there's so many parallels here, like with this and like contest prep. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's like, it's all the little details and how do you time it? And of course, everybody's a little bit different. And so over a period of time of you working with an athlete, it's like you try different things and you just keep tweaking it and tweaking it and until you get that perfect combination. Um, and then the judges change, right? <laughs> Go face down. You know, judges. <laughs> It's so the difference between bodybuilding like what you do. The only thing that you, the only criteria the judge is like you lock it out, right? Right, yeah. As long as you lock it out, you get the score. I, li I like those rules way better. Yeah. Than <laughs> no kidding. So I was kind of explaining you before these those traction tables are straight line. So out of each vertebrae, exit, exit spinal nerves. And you've got all of these intrinsic stabilizing muscles around each one of your vertebrae. So when you get on one of those traditional traction tables, it's vertical. So you're, you're going straight up and down. So let's say you've got a restriction right there in your spine. And now you've got all your body weight hanging on that one spot. And then all the muscles around that spine are tightening to try and protect that vertebrae. This just kind of distributes the force so you're not like putting all of that force in one, one particular spot. What do you feel, PJ? Still feels a good stretch. Um, the more you breathe, the more, the more you're, uh, you're viable. So do this, just push yourself towards your feet just a little bit. Just change the fulcrum point a little, yeah, just slide back just a little bit further. You know what I noticed lately, PJ, now that I think about it? What? When you're on the table, your hands aren't cold anymore. I, I don't know if you noticed that or not, but I'm just realizing that. Yeah, I guess I through the ceiling, keep your traps relaxed, squeeze that, rotate to your left. Good, come on back and relax, and squeeze, and go to your right. Come on back, which side's tighter? All right. Okay, so squeeze and turn. Come on back. Squeeze and turn. Come on back. So what do you think that chattering is? Me being a pussy. <laughs> no. <laughs> so again, the assumption would be is like, oh, he's really tight. But if you look turn, is that there's a big difference there between active and passive. So that's stability. Mm -hmm. Turn. Okay, relax. Deep breath in. Exhale. Turn in the opposite direction. And relax. Stay relaxed. There you go. Good. Now compare the two sides. <laughs> Night and day, right? <laughs> I 
go. Now I can barely even go this way. <laughs> okay, you're missing the gold over here. This is the money right here. Okay. Come on back. You know, since you guys have heard of bro science, right? Obviously. Of course. So this is kind of like the, you know, the argument, the rehab guys are sitting back here and saying, oh, you guys are idiots. You're stupid. You're destroying yourselves, right? And meanwhile, I was like, yeah, you guys are all like skinny pencil neck geeks, right? So they go <laughs> back and forth. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, there's a lot that we can learn from each other. And something that I think that's credit to PJ is that he's willing to try some of this stuff. I regret not doing a lot of this, if not most of it, through the years of just working through injuries foolishly and just trying to just keep getting stronger and bigger and not addressing all these things. So now I'm trying to make up for all that, that lost time. But the real reason that, that I want to put this video out is because I'm trying to make sure you guys don't do a lot of the stupid things that I did because I think if bodybuilders got into doing at least some of this functional stuff that you would have a hybrid Jay Cutler that could shoot a basketball and throw a baseball and golf. And, and I was joking the other day and, and not get hurt doing everyday things. Well, so. There's been kind of a shift of, particularly with the technology in the last 10 to 15 years, because the way that it used to be, and I see this in golf and tennis and certainly in bodybuilding is, is that if you train five days a week, eight hours a day, then I'm gonna train six days a week, 10 hours a day, and I'm just gonna train more and harder than you and that's gonna give me the advantage. But what we learned is that actually doesn't give you an advantage, you just wind up being injured more. Mm -hmm. So then what's the new frontier? Well, the new frontier is how can we recover better so that we're not injured all the time, so that the, when we are training, we can actually like train at full capacity. And I think, you know, certainly, you know, I'm not a professional bodybuilder, but I've, you know, had my experiences with sports and fighting and all of that. And I'm kind of the same way, you know, now at 45 years old, if I said, you know, some of the injuries and stuff, if I could go back, I would certainly do things different. So I think that that's kind of the new frontier is, you know, uh, bodybuilding is one of those sports that's incredibly demanding. And so, you know, similar to a Navy SEAL, I think they say that on average, they spend a million dollars in training a Navy SEAL. And what happens is right when a Navy SEAL reaches a point in their career where their operational experience makes them invaluable, they're at a point where their body is just so broken down that they can't continue. So, you know, I think this could be, you know, this kind of marriage of, you know, bodybuilding and biomechanics and technology is, you know, the next wave of the future is, you know, more longevity. So. Well, I know that if my shoulders start looking good again, then everybody's going to be starting to do stuff like this. So we tried everything else. So that's what I'm doing every every few days, guys. And then I'm going to training, which I'm going to do right now after. So huge thank you, Don, for coming Absolutely. and doing this video with us. The science people will like this video a lot. Some of the meatheads will think it's boring, but there's a lot to learn and a lot that you can apply to yourself. So peace out. And again, thank you so much. Tonight. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it.